Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Rob Unscripted. This episode brought to you by the mullet. Nowhere else can you get a haircut that represents both your business side and your party side. Today we're going to talk about the basics of skeletal modeling. And when I say basics, I mean bare bones basics. Uh, I'm going to start with basically just a gray screen uh, and, and, and build you up through a series of, uh, of techniques that I like to use to... Um, uh, to, to really transfer information between multiple uh, multiple part files so that you can control the entire assembly uh, from a single part file so you can call it base component modeling you can call it skeletal modeling um, but I've got a pretty exa a pretty simple example here that I'm gonna walk through we're gonna we're gonna build out this spider clip so what I'm gonna do first off is is again this this episode is going to be very uh, very basic. So I'm going to walk through creating uh, the initial part. So as you can see, I've got Inventor set up to where it doesn't actually start a new sketch right away. Uh, I have it prompt me for where does a sketch need to be. And what that allows me to do is really orient my uh, my base component of this assembly accordingly. And I also have it set to where whenever I create a sketch it automatically projects the origin. And those are both done through the tools application options, just um, something that I, that I prefer to do. So by placing a couple horizontal and vertical constraints then my, my uh, geometry here uh, maintains a specific relative distance between um, uh, or relative to zero. So I'm going to start dimensioning this out, and you know, the first one I'm going to say I want it to be 12 inches. The second dimension I want it to be a square, so I'll just simply reference the original dimension. Now here's where skeletal modeling really begins to take form here in the parameters dialog box, and you know, typically what you want to do in here is uh, solve your design mathematically before you begin to create too many. Uh, too many pieces of geometry. You, you actually want the geometry to to reflect the um, uh, what you solve here in the parameters box. So as you can see, I'm I'm starting to name you know the height, and you saw it automatically update the equation uh, in the reference. I'm going to add a thickness parameter here. Uh, additionally, I'm going to create a hole spacing parameter where here you can see that, that I'm actually putting in an equation, and any one of these values. Uh, that you put in here, or you know, as long as you put in a calculable value, uh, Inventor's going to solve it. So here's an example where I want to put a parameter that I'm actually not even going to use in this part. I'm going to use it in another part. And here I can go in and I can change the unit type uh, to where, with this particular part, it's going to make more sense for me to understand how far uh, this uh, that post is going to reach out and hold up the end of that spider clip in feet rather than in inches. So I've placed as many of the parameters as I can think of so far, and you don't have to think of all of them. Um, but here, within this feature, now I can reference the thickness of the material, and whenever that thickness changes, then of course that uh, that particular um, that particular feature is going to change as well. Now here's another use of that uh, base parameter. Um, you saw that I put in a parameter for hole spacing, and here what I'll do is I'll place a center point. And again, I'll simply reference the hole spacing parameter, which was based upon some sort of mathematical equation. I wanted to maintain a relative distance from an edge, from center, what have you. Whatever you choose to put in there, you can. Now, I've made my first mistake of this particular demo. And <laughs> I'll go ahead and update my, uh, my parameters here. And now that, uh, that hole is appropriately positioned. Now, I'm going to use that. Uh, particular expression one more time after I place my first hole. Before I get to that, here within the hole diameter, again, clear difference between engineering tool and geometry tool, I'm going to tell the engineering tool, Inventor, to place a clearance hole based upon a specific size hex head bolt. And I didn't know what the, you know, that it was 0.55 or 0.78 or whatever the distance needed to be. I just told it what bolt is eventually going to be placed in there. So again, with that parameters, I'm going to say this time, rather than hole spacing, I'll just say hole spacing times two. And now I get my appropriate spacing between the four holes of this particular plate. Again, that was all done by creating a set of parameters that I was able to solve this particular design. Now, the geometry that you see on the screen is, is by no means meant to impress any of the, any of the viewers on here. I clearly, 
um, that's not the point here. What we're, what we're getting across is the techniques to, that that, uh, that we use for skeletal modeling or base mo base part modeling techniques. So I created one part, the base part. Now I'm getting ready to uh, create another part, and this part is going to represent the post that gets welded to the base. Now before I place a single dimension here, though, I need to get the information from my base part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link not a spreadsheet, but I'm going to link an inventor part file to this particular part and that way it brings in all of the parameters that I need and now I have a single point to go and begin to manage these two components so here you can see I'll put a, a, a nice real quick easy formula in here to get the, uh, the diameter of that again reference the thickness of the material from the original part to get this offset distance and then my last particular feature I'm going to put on here is again is going to reference a parameter that I put into the base plate but I didn't use in the base plate I needed to use it here and the reason I did that is again I want to go back to that single part a, a, a base part so that I can manage all of the files within this assembly uh, from from that standpoint so I've got two part files now and what I need to do is I need to bring those two part files into an assembly file. Now see, I told you this was going to be a little bit basic, but um, hopefully you'll be able to take this technique and, and really drive some advanced modeling from it. So I'll take my base part here and put it in as a base component. And then again, I'll place another part and bring it into the assembly. Now when you do so, the first part that you bring in is going to be grounded, which means it has zero degrees of freedom. Uh, the second one that I brought in here has full degree of freedom. So what I need to do is I need to generate the relationships between these two components through constraints. So I'll mate face to face there uh, and then I'll go through and I'll add some flush constraints. Now you saw me on another video um, utilize a macro to uh, place origins um, and I could have used something like that uh, except for the first constraint that I placed I needed it to be positioned relative to another component not relative to zero. Now, I made my second mistake of this particular demo. Uh, see, even my recordings are uh, somewhat unscripted. And what I needed to do here was not a diameter, but a radius. And again, just reference the original one. And, you know, real, by engineering's 99% uh, mistakes, most demos are not 99% mistakes. But nevertheless, um, you, can see the <laughs> you can see the techniques that I'm using here. So... What I'm going to do next is I'm going to model a component within the context of the assembly. The previous two examples I modeled up a part by starting a new part file. In this example, I'm starting a new part file within the assembly. So uh, just a couple different ways you can use this. Uh, here I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to model an end cap. And again, I want to reference some information from the base component. I want to know what the thickness is, I want to know what the diameter is, so that if you change the thickness, if you change the diameter, if you change the height, which is which helps drive the diameter of, of the of the post, all of those things are reciprocal and I want to make sure that every single component has all the information that it needs for my base component. Uh, e even though this is a you know, simple round plate, there's there's not a lot of geometry to it, but it, it's it's the it's the fact that I know, I know that I'm going to go through a number of design iterations with this. So I'm trying to build in as much intelligence as I possibly can. So again, I'll reference the thickness. Um, I'll reference the, the diameter, offset the thickness so that this, this end cap is just the exact right size that it needs to be. So all right, I've got, uh, I got the three components in that are going to represent this particular weldment. Um, I chose not to have it automatically flush because I wanted a little bit of offset here. So I'll do an insert constraint with a uh, 0.55 uh, inch offset so I can, I can go ahead and fit a weld in there. And speaking of welds, one of the things that I, I, I want to do with this particular assembly is I'll, I want to go ahead and weld this thing together so that when it gets put into uh, the next assembly, it gets treated as a, as a weldment in the bill of material. Um, but before I do so, let's go ahead and, and test out and make sure that all of our parameters are working. So if I change the height, uh, you know, my, my, my bolt spacing, the post diameter, the end cap, uh, as, long, uh, and, and as well as changing the thickness, all of these things, I now have an, another iteration of that particular assembly. 
This one's getting long. I'm going to cut it off here, and we're going to begin with part two.